Our study of Isaiah takes us now to chapter 28, and this begins a new section which will last for several chapters. The overall point being that God's people are seeking an alliance with Egypt. That's a theme that uh, took place earlier in the book as well, back in chapter 7. But it is resumed here, that discussion of Judah's desire to ally themselves with Egypt. Uh, and for the next several chapters, God will express his disappointment, his frustration, and his promise of punishment against his people as a result of their lack of trust in him. The, the, the crux of the matter is Judah wants to solve this problem of a serious threat on their own. They want to work out their own solution to the situation and not just simply trust in God. Uh, and so with that said, they are seeking alliance, in this case with Egypt. And in chapter 28, God will write them to say, uh, you have made an alliance, but it is not with Egypt, it is with death. Uh, and so that is the majority of this letter, or rather this chapter, <clears throat> is Isaiah's description of God's disappointment in their sin, their being overcome by pride and the belief that they can save themselves, followed by the promise of punishment that will come. The end of the chapter, the last about half a dozen or so verses, uh, is its own little self-contained illustration of the way God is approaching the punishment of Judah. Uh, the people of Judah are very, very obviously going to endure the punishment of God and they're going to take it, in a lot of ways, the wrong way. They're going to assume that God is being unfair to them. They're going to assume that God is being unjust, uh, that he's being excessive in his force. But God is going to say to them over and over, and he will at the end of this one chapter in particular, uh, that his punishment is for a purpose. The amount that they will endure is the particular amount that they need to endure, but they won't endure one bit more or one bit less than God has planned for them. Uh, it's, a, it's a rather lengthy chapter, it's about 29 verses, so let's just start and see where the text takes us. It begins, Isaiah 28, verse 1, with the prophet writing, Woe, a word meaning, uh, look at how sad this is. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. So we begin, though the actual subject matter is Judah, we begin with Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, with Ephraim being the tribe closest to Judah's border, uh, and thus representing all of uh, Israel itself. And so what Isaiah will do for the next several verses to open the chapter is describe the sin of Israel and their particular pride and how it's led to their destruction, which will lead to Isaiah making the point, don't follow in their footsteps. You're going to see them fall into captivity because of their arrogance and because of their pride and because of their lack of trust in God. Don't make the same mistakes that they did. And so to make that point, he describes Israel. and He starts by describing it in the beautiful terms. He says of Ephraim that they have glorious beauty, but he counters that with how it is a fading flower. He describes them as sitting as the head of fat, fat valleys, but then he says they are overcome, in this case, with wine. He calls them drunkards of Ephraim, overflowing with wine, not literally drunk with alcohol, though that was a sin they certainly committed. This is the, the kind of uh, metaphorical drinking. This is They're drunk on their own pride. They are consumed by self. They have become drunk on their own uh, belief in themselves. And so he says of them, Woe to the crown of pride, to the capital city of the prideful nation, to Samaria in particular, uh, as he writes about uh, Israel. So to the, this crown city, Samaria, which sits uh, on a hill with valleys around it, as he described it here, the head of fat valleys, sitting as a hill under valleys, almost like a head on top of shoulders, um, resting above all with beautiful flowers crowning that uh, elegant area, but he says that they're fading flowers. He says that they are uh, not going to survive for very much longer. Overcome with wine. Well, again, once more, drunkenness, yes, was a problem, uh, as it will be said of Judah as well, but this is a metaphorical kind. This is, they're drunk on their own pride. Verse 2, Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one. A mighty and strong what? A tempest of hail and destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down the earth with the hand. The hand is his hand, his hand of vengeance, and that he is bringing against Israel the north. As an object lesson for the, for the southern kingdom of Judah to see and to realize that they need to not follow in their footsteps. But he describes the coming Assyrian invasion which will conquer Israel as a strong and mighty tempest, as this overflowing and destroying storm. 
some of the key words he offers here in this verse about Assyria. Uh, he calls them mighty, emboldened, the word means. He calls them strong, powerful. Uh, he says that they are a storm of mighty waters, in this case vast in scope. You can't run from them or hide from them. Overflowing, you cannot divert them or, or steer them away from you. They are coming for Israel. They will conquer Israel because they're moved by the hand of God, providentially attacking his people. Verse 3, the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden under feet. Assyria soldiers will stomp uh, stomp them into the mud. He, they will stomp over them, trodden them, tread them down under their feet. He calls them once more, as he did in verse 1, the crown of pride. He will again restate his description in the next verse, but here he reminds them that the sin of Israel on display here is their arrogance, their pride, their their unjustified belief in their own superiority. The crown of pride led them to become drunkards of Ephraim. <clears throat> Verse 4, And the glorious beauty, once more calling Israel that, which is on the head of the fat valley, once more describing the city of Samaria, the capital, that he says again, it shall be a fading flower. Then he adds, And as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looks upon it sees, while it is yet in his hand, he eats it up. He describes Israel from the perspective of the Assyrians as though they are a traveling person who sees a tree that is blooming and blossoming and whose fruit is, is already bearing on the tree. And before the fruit fully ripens and falls to the ground, he will run up and scoop it in his hand before it hits the dirt. Uh, he will eat it in his hand, eat it up while it's still in his hand. In other words, uh, Assyria will look at Israel like a blossoming tree that's just waiting to be plucked. And that's what they'll do. They will pluck them and take them away. Verse 5. In that day, the day of Assyrian invasion, shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. And so you see now why he described uh, Israel in such beautiful terms. It was to show a contrast. You have Israel that believes themselves to be a glorious, beautiful town, a beautiful nation, this, this uh, filled with beauty and filled with splendor. But their crown of glory is fool's gold. God's crown of glory will shine evermore. And so he says in that day, when your luster fades, when your glory diminishes, God will be a crown of glory and his will not fade. God will be a diadem of beauty, a crown of beauty, radiant, the word means. Yet its radiance will not diminish. But its radiance will shine for whom? In particular, the end of verse 5, he says, unto the residue. The word means the remnant. The same remnant we've been discussing this whole book. That faithful few of Judah that will survive uh, captivity, return to their promised land, and will eventually produce the Messiah. That residue of his people will see the beautiful glory of the Lord. And so with that, we turn from Israel to Judah and to the problems of Judah after he describes a little bit about the residue, the remnant, in verse 6. It will be a, a residue of the people, verse 6, and for a spirit of judgment to him that sits in judgment and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. God will protect his remnant, Israel, going into captivity, Judah, soon to go into captivity. But there will be a faithful remnant that will be preserved, a residue that will endure. And he describes them in three ways. He describes them those who seek the justice of God, judgment the word was, those who follow God, who sit in judgment, who go along with the justice of God, and those who defend God, who will go to battle for God. Those who will, who will have strength, the word means valor in this verse, to go and fight and defend the Lord, those who will live by the faith of God, they will endure <clears throat> the captivity. But that's only a faithful small remnant of Judah. The majority of the nation is wicked and fallen into spiritual disrepair, as he says in verse 7. But they also, they, Judah, also, along with Israel, have erred through wine. Not literally. Yes, literally too. Yes, they were a bunch of drunkards. But in this case, they're drinking the same drink that Israel drank. The, the poison of arrogance, the poison of pride. They are drunken on their own self-worth. And they have an overinflated sense of their own self-worth. So he says they've erred through wine. And through strong drink are, the King James says, out of the way. It means literally staggered and stumbled oh, off the road. As the word err means, they have, they have swayed away from, strayed away from. The priest and the prophet. So here he specifies it's the leaders of the people 
who are at fault, who have led the majority of the people away. The priests and the prophet. The priests, the men who go from men to God. The prophet, the men who go from God to man. Both have stumbled. They have both erred through strong drink, swallowed up of wine. What kind of strong drink? What kind of wine? They have gone out of the way through strong drink. How? He says they err through vision and they stumble in judgment. Their vision is blurred. Not literally. I mean, that happens when you get drunk. But he means their, their foresight, their ability to, to do what God says and to know what God wants is diminished now because they have been drunken on their own pride. They stumble. They, they fall away from God because they don't do what God says to do. Their judgment has been impaired. Yes, when you drink and you get drunk, your judgment becomes impaired. Your vision is, is blurred. But that's just the visual picture Isaiah paints to describe the arrogance of Judah and especially her leaders. Uh, so what happens when a person gets drunk? They fall over and embarrass themselves. Verse 8, For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness. That means uh, they, they, they um, defecated themselves. So it's, a, it's not a pretty picture. They have vomited and they have defecated so that there is no place clean. All over them they are filthy. From some manner of filth or another, uh, they are completely covered in, in a disgusting filth. And so that's the picture God sees when he looks at the leaders of his people. Drunken, staggered, stumbled, sick on their own pride. And yet their response to Isaiah is recorded in verse 9. He's quoting from these prophets and priests. And they will say to Isaiah, whom shall he teach knowledge? Who is this guy to teach me knowledge? They will say. Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Who is he to give me doctrine, to lecture me on the law of God? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts? That's what they think Isaiah thinks about them. Do you think we're just children? you think we're just babies? Do you think we were born yesterday? Just weaned off the breast just yesterday? Who are you to teach us? In other words, we're older than you. We're wiser than you. We know more than you. Isaiah, shame on you. Verse 10, Isaiah comes at them with doctrine. How do they respond? For precept must be upon precept, they mock. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little, there a little. What did they say to the law of God being taught to them? Ugh, it's just precepts. It's just written down rules. It's line upon line. It's just chiseled and stone commandments. It's just lot, commandments and commandments, rules and rules. That's all Isaiah has to say. Here a little rule there, there a little rule over there. That's all Isaiah has to say. Well, that's what God writes, and that's what we're supposed to do. But the leaders don't want to hear that anymore. So instead of just not doing it, they have turned to mocking the idea of it. They mock precepts, and they mock the lines of instruction, and they mock the, the law of God that describes what to do in every kind of situation. And they say, no, it's just here a little this, there a little that. They're, they are, they are uh, being dismissive of the law of God. So, Isaiah says, if you won't hear me speak to you in our native tongue, God will speak to you. God will tell you in the new message. He'll give you a new message in a new tongue. With stammering lips, with a strange sound, in another tongue, a foreign language, will God speak to this people. You don't want to listen to me in Hebrew? God will speak to you in Assyrian and in Chaldean, in Babylonian. He will use their languages to deliver his message. I'm giving you warning. They're giving you punishment. Verse 12. To whom? To his people. To Judah. He said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. God showed them the promised land. God showed them Canaan, their land. Their land for Israel's uh, descendants. And he says, this is your land. It is your land of rest. It is your place of refreshing for the weary to lay down on their burdens and to, eat, and, uh, to drink milk and eat honey. This is your land. All he asked of them was that they be faithful. Deuteronomy 28. But they refused. They would not listen. They would not follow the precepts. They would not read the lines. They would not take to heart here and there everywhere God gave them instruction. They rejected it. And now they're going to be punished. The word of the Lord, verse 13, was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. That's how God gave his message. But you mocked it. So instead, you're going to go. By the word they were instructed and by the word they will be punished. Why? Because you're judged by the word of God. He gives it. You either follow it or you don't follow it. You're either blessed or you're cursed. They chose not to follow it. And so 
into verse 13, they're going to go, depart, the word means. They're going to fall backward. They're going to wobble and fall down. They're going to be broken, unrepairable. They're going to be snared, captured. They're going to be taken, removed. You're going to lose your land. Verse 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, speaking to the leaders of the people. You scornful men, not you men who scorn God. No, in this case, it is God who scorns you. God who disdains your sin. God who loathes your sin. God who hates your sin. Loves the people. Hates what they've become. Hates the sin that they've fallen into. You scornful men. Your actions cause scorn on the part of God. You that rule this people which is in Jerusalem, you leaders of the people, verse 15, because you have said, God has promised punishment. God has said it from the beginning. If you don't repent, I'm going to send in an invader and they're going to take you out of the land. But what have they said? What has been their response? Have they turned to God? No. Have they repented and said they were sorry? No. None of that. They have said, we've made a covenant. They have said, we've made an agreement. They have said, when the overflowing scourge passes through, it shall not come to us, because we have a refuge. They say, we have hid ourselves. Now, uh, there's a few key words that I left out in that verse, because those are the words that Isaiah is adding. Those are the modifiers he's adding to the words that they have worded. They have come back at Isaiah and said, we don't worry about Assyria. We're not, we're not worried about that. We're not worried about God. You see, because we have a covenant. We have an, an agreement in place with Egypt. We have a covenant with them, not with God. We have a covenant with Egypt. We have an agreement with them. We have an agreement. We have a deal. We've struck a deal with Egypt. And so when the overflowing scourge, when that big bad threat of God, Assyria, comes to pass through our land, it's not going to come to us because we have a refuge with Egypt. We have hid ourselves in Egypt. They're going to protect us. We're going to team up and we'll stop Assyria. We're not worried. And Isaiah says, nope. You've made a covenant with death. You've got an agreement with the grave. The King James says hell, but that word is sheol. It means the, the, the grave. You've got a refuge, but it's of lies. It can't really protect you. You hid yourself, but in falseness, it can't really hide you. You've got nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. Your agreement that you've struck a deal uh, to protect yourself with Egypt, it's, it's not going to last. As he'll say in a couple of verses, it's going to be disannulled. It's going to be broken. And in fact, when Sennacherib came and attacked J Jerusalem, Egypt was nowhere to be found. They didn't keep their end of the bargain. You're you're lying on uh, you're relying on a, a helper who's not going to be there for you. Now we come to verse 16, probably the most famous verse of the chapter, uh, one of the more famous verses of the whole book, perhaps. Therefore, thus says the Lord God: Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone. A precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believes shall not make haste. That's the King James translation of Isaiah 28, 16. Assyria is going to hurt you. Let's keep this in the context first. Uh, God has said to the people through Isaiah the prophet, Assyria is coming. He's, they're going to hurt you very badly, but they're not going to destroy you. Oh, I'm threatening it now, but when the moment comes, I'm going to drive them away because that's not my plan. That's not my will. That's not the way it's supposed to be done. Babylon's going to come in. They're going to hurt you. They're going to pull you in captivity. But Assyria, they're just going to hurt you. They're not going to take you away. They're going to bloody your nose. Babylon's going to knock you out. But Assyria's going to come in and hurt you. But they're not going to take you. 2 Kings 19. The angel's going to destroy the army of Sennacherib. But why? Why won't they take them? Because God has a plan and it involves the Messiah coming at just the right time, under just the right circumstances. And so this verse here is a prophecy of that Messiah to come. He says at the beginning of the verse, God, the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a foundation stone. For a foundation, he says, I've laid a stone. In other words, I'm building something, God says. A series not going to destroy you because that would ruin the building. I am going to build something, lay a foundation. I'm going to lay a foundation of a stone. What kind of stone? He says it's a foundation stone. A foundation, something you build around. He says it is a tried stone, durable. He says it is a sure stone, uh, dependable. He calls it a precious stone, valuable. Uh, and he says he that believeth, that word means he that leans on it. 
he that relies on it. The one who gains their support from this building erected by this stone, he that believes shall not make haste, literally shall not be quickly disappointed. Sometimes you lean on something and it gives way. Sometimes you sit in a chair and it breaks. Sometimes you lean on something and it doesn't have the weight to support you. This building, this wall you can lean against, this seat you can sit on, it's not going to break, it's not going to buckle, it's not going to bend, it's not going to collapse, it's going to support your weight. It will not break. You will not be disappointed by what is being built here. Now this text, this verse is quoted twice directly in your New Testament. It's quoted in Romans chapter 9, verses 31 through 33, where Paul is describing the Jew and Gentile and how both can come into the Christian family and how he quotes from this text to say that the, the building that was erected by that stone is a house built for Jew and Gentile. But that stone is a stumbling block for the Jews who don't want to let the Gentiles in the church of Christ. For the Jews who want to keep it a Jewish affair only, keep Christianity just for the Jews, that stone becomes a stumbling block. For those who want to obey the gospel, it becomes a rock of protection. For the rest, it becomes a rock of offense. It's also quoted in 1 Peter 2, 5-7, through where Peter talks about the foundation that is built upon Jesus Christ. And again, for those who want to obey, it's a foundation. But for those who don't want to obey, it becomes a stumbling block. Now, it's not directly quoted, but it's certainly that the idea is alluded to by Jesus in Matthew 16, 18, when he said uh, the, that what Peter knew of him was true, that, that he is the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that based on that truth, that foundation, he would build his church. And so he is the stone, the, the, the reality of his divinity is the foundation stone around which the church of Christ um, is built. In addition to that, and this is related but not necessarily quoted, is Psalm 118.22, where David says the stone that the builders rejected is itself become the chief cornerstone. Jesus quotes from Psalm 118 uh, in Matthew 21.42-45, and he attributes the builders who rejected the stone as the leaders of the people. Much like Isaiah attacks the leaders here, Jesus attacks the leaders then, in his day, the Pharisees and the scribes and so forth, as rejecting him, the stone that was rejected that will become the chief cornerstone. And so there's a lot of moving pieces when you read this verse. There's an immediate context, there's a direct quotation, and there are certain uh, allusions to it throughout the Bible. But uh, the point Isaiah is making is God's not going to fully destroy you. God has a plan for you. As he said earlier, there's a residue that will remain. There's a remnant that will exist. Now, <clears throat> the, the verse ends in verse 16 with, will not make haste. But there were no verses. There, there was there was no divisions like that in the original text. The middle of the first half of verse 17 finishes that thought. So it says, "Those that believe in the stone will not be quickly disappointed. Judgment also will I lay to the line." He's building something. He has to make sure the walls of this building are straight and even. And so the line, the 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 um, the, the the measurement that he uses, the level that he uses to make sure the line is straight. He says that line is judgment or justice, always right thinking, which motivates right doing, which comes next. Righteousness will be the plummet or the plumb line. When they would drop the weighted line down to make sure the wall was straight this way. It has to be straight this way, that's judgment. It has to be straight this way, that's righteousness. Right thinking, right doing. This will be a perfectly straight, perfectly built building. Not a physical building. That's just the illustration he's using, but it will be a perfectly straight construction of God's making, uh, uh, built by his son Christ. This will be his church. The new thought begins in the middle of verse 17, which takes us back to 700 B.C. and the problem of Judah. And he says, And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. That takes you back to verse 15. You think you're resting in a refuge, of, but it's of lies. And the hail of the storm that God is raining upon you, it's going to wash all that away, your refuge of lies. The waters of the, the flood of His judgment coming upon you is going to overflow every hiding place. You think you can hide, but you can't. He can find you in every nook and cranny and crevice. And your covenant, that agreement you have with death, will be disannulled. That agreement you have is going to be disannulled and lead you to death, in other words. Cancel the contract. Your agreement with hell, the grave, your agreement will not stand. 
Again, when uh, Sennacherib's army attacked, Egypt was nowhere to be found. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trotted down by it. You think you can avoid it, but it's coming for you, and it's going to hit you hard. Assyria is going to attack. 19. From the time that it goes forth, it shall take you. The moment Assyria starts starting, Judah will start stopping. And there's not going to be any resistance. As soon as they decide to start, you're going to start falling. They will take you. Morning by morning, no relief, no rest. Day by day and night by night, no rest. There's no time when they stop, no time when they yield. They're going to keep pressing forward and keep attacking you. And it shall be a vexation only uh, to understand the report. In other words, when the, the news comes with every conquered town, with every conquered city, with every plot of land taken by Assyria, with every time the report comes to Jerusalem, to the capital, it's going to bring vexation to the leaders. Vexation means fear, agitation. They're going to realize their alliance has fallen apart. They're going to realize their, their treaty, their, their um, uh, covenant, uh, their agreements, all of it has, has disappeared, gone, and they have no leg to stand on. So all they'll have left is fear and agitation. 20. For the bed is shorter than a man can stretch himself on it, the covering narrower than that he can wrap himself in it. You try to make your bed and lie with Egypt, but it's, it's a twin bed. It's not big enough for the both of you. Egypt's lying in it. They're not sticking their neck out for you. You're going to be pushed out of bed. You try to be covered by Egypt's blanket, but it's too small for you. It's too small for both of you. It's only big enough for one. Egypt's got it, not you. So they're going to kick you out of bed and leave you to be destroyed. 21. For the Lord shall rise up as in the Mount um, Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. He references two historical battles um, when God stood with the people and helped fight the army that was fighting God. He mentions Perizim, which is 2 Samuel 5. And he mentions uh, Gibeon, which is Joshua chapter uh, 10. Yes, 10. Um, in both instances, God stood with his people. I guess you could argue the people stood with God. That's a better way to put it. But the point is that God personally intervened in the battle and had direct hand in the, in the winning of the battle. Well, that's going to happen here, but he's not on your side. That's the, that's the big difference. God's going to be involved in the battle, but not on your side. He's going to do a strange work, a foreign work. He's going to do a strange act, a foreign act, not like it was then. The only way it's similar to then is that God is on the battlefield. But here, he's on the other side. He's against you, Judah. 22. Now, therefore, be not mockers. Don't be laughing at Israel when they fall to Assyria. You're next. Lest your bands be made strong, they will shackle you. Uh, for I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption, a complete totality of... Determined upon the whole earth, what is? Punishment. Your punishment is coming. It will be complete. It will be total. It will be all-consuming. You're going to be punished. Assyria will not take them into captivity. Babylon will. But Assyria will do plenty of damage in the meantime. 23 through 29 is that last part of the chapter that we discussed at the beginning of this video. From 23 through 29, he's using an illustration of a farmer who digs in the ground and sows a seed and takes care of what he needs to do to, to make his harvest. Uh, essentially, he walks you through the process of the farmer tilling the land until he sits down and he eats the bread that he cooks with the, with, uh, or the meal that he makes, rather, with what he um, works with in his harvest. From point A to point Z, he walks you through that process, and then at the end of it, he ties it all together to make his spiritual application. It begins in verse 23 with an introduction. Give ear and hear my voice. Hearken and hear my speech. Listen carefully. Hearken. I'm going to tell you a story, Isaiah says to Judah. I want you to listen. I want you to make application to yourselves and to God and see why you need to be relying on Him and see how when punishment comes, it's not the end. That's the object lesson to learn. But we start with the illustration. Uh, verse 24. Does the plowman plow all day to sow? Does he open and break the clods of his ground? He starts with a rhetorical question. What does a harvester do first? First, he plows. He breaks the clods. He breaks up the, the clumps of the ground. He tills the ground so he can be ready to, to sow the seed. He doesn't just till the ground. He doesn't overdo it or he will ruin it. And that's the, that's the, the lesson that keeps popping up. He doesn't do more than he's supposed to. He tills the ground just enough 
so that he can sow the seed. Verse 25, when he has made plain the face thereof, when he has tilled the earth, does he not cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin and cast in the principal wheat and the appointed barley and the rye in their place? Does he not scatter all the various seeds that he is supposed to to grow his crop, whatever it may be? And he mentions um, uh, fitching or fitches, which is um, caraway seeds. He mentions cumin, which is cumin, um, uh, barley, which is which is barley, and rye, which is not rye. This kind of rye, this is spelt. And so he has these various um, grains that he he scatters. So that he that he does one thing, but he doesn't overdo it. Then he does the next thing. Twenty six. For his God does instruct him to do to discretion and does teach him. In other words, the harvester, the planter, the, the sower of the seed does exactly what he's supposed to do, no more, no less, because he learns from God what to do. Now, when did God stop and give agriculture tips to farmers in Judah? Well, he did it. What Isaiah's point is, and we won't see until the end of this text, is that he learned by example, that God taught him by example. God did something that left an illustration for the farmer to see how he's supposed to do his job. Just like a parent disciplines their child, and you learn to do that by following the example of God the Father, the farmer follows God the farmer uh, and learns what to do and what not to do. But again, that point won't be made until we get to the end. Verse 27, For the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff, and the cumin with a rod. Again, the farmer does, but he doesn't overdo. He does what he's supposed to do, but not too much. He doesn't uh, uh, beat the fitches, the grain, with a mallet, a hammer, the threshing instrument. Sometimes you have grain, you have to break the chaff away from the grain, and you would use a mallet to crack it and separate it that way. But the, this, uh, the, the fitches, the caraway seed, is too fragile. It would ruin. The cumin is too small. You cannot uh, roll over it with a cart. It won't work. You would ruin it. Instead, he beats it gently with a rod, with a staff. The kind of staff that you would whack a, a child on the hand with as discipline. <clears throat> with that staff, he gently pats and breaks the, the chaff away from the grain that he wants to harvest. In other words, the farmer does what he's supposed to do, but does not overdo it. As it says in verse 28, Bread corn is bruised, and really that is an improperly translated phrase. What he's asking is, is the corn bruised? Does the corn bruise? Does the, the, the grain, the bread, grain, the word means, when he beats it, does he ruin it? No, he would if he rolled over with a cartwheel, then it would bruise, and that word means spoil or ruin. If he whacked it with a mallet, that would ruin it, as he says in the middle of 28, because he will not ever be threshing it. He's not going to overdo it. He will not break it with the will of his cart. He will, he's not going to overdo it, nor bruise it with his horsemen. He's not going to overdo it. In other words, he will. he's going to punish it. He's got to uh, attack it a few times. He's got to hit it with a mallet, but he's not going to overdo it. And that's the object lesson. Judah's about to be punished, but God's not going to overdo it. God is not attacking out of, out of uh, petty anger. This is about justice. This is a legal punishment. God's punishment is always legally administered, not emotionally. God is going to punish you. He's going to attack you. He's going to hit you with a ruler on the wrist, but he's not going to overdo it. Verse 29. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. He has a plan for Judah, and it involves some pain, but he's not going to completely destroy you because there will be a remnant spared. He has a plan, and his plan is wonderful. His plan is excellence in its execution, the working of it. So you're going to be beaten like grain is beaten by a farmer, but then he's going to sow the seed, and from it will grow uh, the Messiah to come. Now that is this chapter, but the, the overall theme of this section of the book doesn't end here. The continued discussion about Egypt and the betrayal of Judah to God continues in the next chapter, chapter 29, which we'll consider next time. Until then, thank you very much.